Home is Where the Dark Is is supported by and produced at Stygian Sound, a music production suite specializing in producing, mixing, and mastering dark and heavy genres. Stygian Sound offers a collection of instruments and equipment that has been carefully curated and refined to offer you exceptional tools to capture your perfect performance. Have your raw multitracks mixed with distinctive taste. Have your mix fine-tuned with a world-class hybrid master. Visit alexcresioni.com today for more details and to book your slot now. Thanks, Daddy. Welcome, Travis Ference, to Home is Where the Dark Is. Thank you for coming by, man. I appreciate it. It's great to see you. We, uh, I got to see your killer studio a few months back, and uh, now you're at Stygian Sound hanging out. So thanks for coming by, man. I appreciate it. And uh, how's it been going? How's your year been so far? Man, this year has been crazy, but I I just wanted to say that your your studio is epic. Thank you. And I felt like I was coming to a commercial studio because I walked in and you're like, can I get you a water? Can I make you some coffee? And I was like, oh, yes, I love this. It's how I roll, So man. I appreciate the hospitality. Of course. Uh, but yeah, my year's been, it's been cool. I've been enjoying it. I, you know, uh, your listeners probably don't know, but I have a one-year-old. So I'm learning how to be an engineer, have a podcast, and a dad. And it's fucking confusing, but- Oof. I got to figure it out. Hopefully I can swear. Yeah. Uh, I can't imagine the intensity and the, how crammed your schedule is like managing all this, like being a father, a uh, husband, owning a business, having a podcast. It's a lot, man. So props to you for managing all that. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you. It's uh, it's, it, I feel like it's taken like five years of pretending I understand what time management is to even like make what I'm doing acceptable. Like, I feel like I'm just barely making it, but it, but it's nice. It's just, it's a fun balance. So it looks like you're doing great, man. I I love your podcast. Uh, I love like the guests you've been having on lately and it was, it was awesome to be a guest as well. Like that's right. I think I was maybe like over a year ago now, but yeah, I think you're doing really good and, um, you've been doing a lot of great, having a lot of great mixes. And I was checking out your website again cause I, I had checked it out, um, when I first heard about you and then I just, went over it again today like in preparation so yeah let's maybe let's get into the weeds here like how do you how do you feel um the state of the industry has been this year like do you notice any changes or are you getting prepared for any kind of pivoting like going into the rest of the year um because i know like the industry has changed so much and it seems like it's it's been it's so competitive and like just to keep consistent work is like a struggle so how has it been for you and um like has there been certain mixes that you've been really stoked on this year that you've uh, that you've released um oh man i got so many bullet points from that uh well for first thing in my head is uh there's it's actually today there's a an ep coming out by an artist best friend a random like met him on the internet worked together on one song now we've done two eps absolutely love it it's like it's indie pop lots of synth just what i like to listen to which makes it even better to like work on it yeah um but you know to go back to you know changes in the industry i don't know if you've experienced this or if you've met any other engineers or mixers or producers that have i feel like i get a lot of inquiries on my website now for people looking for mix reviews or mentoring i feel like there's there's a this generation of people i'm almost 40 uh this Look gener- good, man Look young <laughs> it's it's because we stay in the dark rooms um this generation of kids that have come up with like garage band and like stuff on now band lab and stuff like this they want to do everything themselves like they want to write the song they want to make the track they want to play the instruments they want to put it out and i feel like they're they're valuing learning how to do that more than they're valuing hiring you know professionals to help them record it or mix it or master it or whatever i don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing but it's something i've kind of noticed in the last six months totally i've noticed that in the last like six years (laughs) to be honest (laughs) like it's uh i mean i was one of those people i was uh when i first started when i first got into audio engineering that's that was my idea it was like well you know gear was it was a little bit more expensive, like to an ent- entry level gear to like get started back then. Like when I was doing it, maybe like shoot, 
15 years ago when I decided I want to make a record by myself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, now it's like super cheap. You just need a laptop and then one of these $300 interfaces and you're good to go. You can make a record. So I understand the temptation to go down that road and because it's like then you can do it yourself on your own time. You have the control. You can make exactly how you like. I get that. At the same yeah. time, I think there are also musicians that realize the value of hiring a producer, hiring an engineer, hiring a mixer that has been doing it for many, many, many years that knows exactly how to help you and to get the best possible product um, in the most efficient amount of time. So I think there's all kinds of variations of people with different mindsets on that. But you're right. I mean, it does seem very hard these days to, you know, to meet. Uh, I see like most, ba- a lot of bands, they have, one of the members is like the engineer that does everything. Yes, somebody or, knows or how to do the thing. the singer or whoever. Yeah. So yeah, it is difficult. Um, but I can t- totally resonate with what you said there, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing. I also think that there's, you know, there's kind of, what do they call it, like beginner's brain or beginner's mind where you're kind of like free. Mm-hmm. So I think if you're making your first couple records and that's how you want to do it, maybe that, it's a more creative, interesting way to do it. Uh, there's no replacement for experience, but, you know, the more records I mix, the more like in my... Uh, system I get, you know, some it's so maybe that's not what somebody's looking for. They're looking for whatever rogue idea they want to have, and they might not get it from you or get it from me. Yeah. But then I, I eventually I think that people come around. You know, if you're in this industry long enough, eventually you want to collaborate in one way or another. So uh, yeah, I think there's magic that can happen in both scenarios. Like there's something really um, just there's something really magical about a, a young artist that really has it and they decide to make their own record on their laptop. And like, it's so, it's so fresh and new that like it comes out amazing. And then maybe they have someone master it or whoever, or they do it all themselves and it sounds great. And there's something, I love that. And there's also, there's also young musicians that realize I just want to focus on songwriting and my instrument and performing the best that I can. And I want to, leave the technical part up to the professionals and magic can happen that way as well. And all in between that. So yeah, it's, um, it's just about finding, you know, like you, the artists you mentioned before with, uh, that you've been working on uh, the EP released, like you, you find the artists that resonate with you and hopefully you resonate with them, um, in the same kind of way and you understand the vibe they're going for and then you can make magic together. So totally. yeah. 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 I mean, I think, uh, it's, I feel lucky that I've been doing this long enough and that I've made a living, you know, working in music so long that I can now try to mainly do projects that resonate with me. You know, not every project is, you know, like this artist, best friend. I still listen to those mixes on Spotify because I like the music. Not every artist is going to be something that I want to listen to when I get up in the morning or go to totally. the gym. But uh, yeah, I feel lucky to get more of those across the desk. Isn't that the, the greatest desk. feeling? Like when you you actually look, you actually want to listen to the mix or the production or the master that you just did for an artist because not only is the song amazing, but you're proud of the job you did and you're like, wow, when I, I'm... I'm looking forward to listening to this and I, I like listening to it compared to maybe other projects that didn't jive so well. Um, or maybe you weren't like extremely, uh, extremely, you know, stoked on the <laughs> quality of the tracks that arrived or whatever. But you know what I'm saying? Like it's, that's one of the, for me, that's one of the best parts of doing this is like enjoying the final product and being, being proud of the artist yeah. and happy that they, wanted to work with you and then happy with the final result. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think those projects are, I think they're easier. I think I finished those mixes, you know, way faster than any other mixes. I enjoy I, something about like, I guess when you really enjoy it, you, I think you get more lost in the music aspect of it. And when you don't necessarily enjoy the song you're working on or recording quality aside, we'll just stick to songs, right? When, when you don't necessarily enjoy the song that, that you're working on, I feel like you and I are so technical that we're like trying to fix something that's not broken because we don't like it. 
Yeah. You know or, what I mean? Yeah, or maybe it's not the greatest song or the greatest arrangement, so you're trying to figure out what can I do in this mix to make it good, but there's really, sometimes there's nothing, no matter what you do with the mix, it's just not going to be good because the song isn't that great. So right. you could get as, you can go as technical and nitpicky with frequencies and compression and EQ that you, that you want to go, but it's just, it's at the end of the day, it's just about, is the song good or not? Yeah. You know? Yeah, everything seems to sound better on a good song. Yeah. You know, you the the term polish a turd is, you know, <laughs> something that's floated around for a long time and it's an awful thing to say, but yeah, it goes back it goes down to the song. And I know I've heard some of your guests talk about that. So my all my guests have talked about that. Anybody that's been in this industry for more than fifteen minutes knows that it's song first, you know. So. Yeah. Do you do like any client outreach or are you more of the type of mixer producer that is just about waiting for the artist to come to you? Um, I think, unfortunately for me, I'm a bit more of the wait for the artist to come to me. But, you know, I've been I've been in L.A. for like, I don't know, like 17 or 18 years. So I have enough of a recurring, like returning client base of people that I call friends that the recommendations through those people, it's like the network is wide enough. Yeah. Um, I wish I was better at the outreach the artist that I mentioned earlier, best friend, it was actually that god awful websites sound better, right? I was like cruising there during the pandemic when they have their they have like their job forum, and uh, I saw you know indie pop band looking for mixer, but they have that website has a limit on the job board of how many uh, submissions a job can get, and I, and it was maxed, and I was like shit, I actually really like this song. I so I found him on Instagram, and I sent him an Instagram message, and I was like, hey. I wanted to, you know, try to apply for this gig or whatever, however you want to call that, you know, doing something on Sound Better. I was like, I love this song, you know, if you would be willing to work with somebody not on that platform, I would be down. And uh, that's how I ended up getting that. So that's like my proof that reaching out to somebody that you're really passionate about works. So it does work. I've reached out to lots, lots of artists that haven't responded or producers that I think are doing dope stuff that, you know, double tap the heart and in, in Instagram too. So it's like, you just have to remember, you have to put a lot of feelers out in the world. Yep. You know, you're not going to get a response from everybody. Totally. That, so. Yeah. It's very challenging because I think as, you know, yeah, we're technical, but you know, we're also artists. Like what we do with mix is very artistic and creative. Um, so I think, in the process of reaching out, like, like it's a little bit more, um, it's like you're, you're kind of not walking on eggshells, but it's like, you want to make yourself known, but you don't want to be too aggressive. Right. So yeah. it's like about the strategies of, okay, how do I approach this artist and let them know about me? Because people aren't just going to flood your inbox if they don't know about you. So it's like, you have to make yourself known, which means you have to, you know, post a lot or email or send direct message or however you want to do it. But yeah, you have to do a lot of that because yeah, it's just, that's just how it works. Unless you're, unless you get really lucky and early in your career and you got like a top 10 hit, you know, super young, and then you just have a flood of clients like yeah. all the time. So. so I still don't even think that, you know, I mean, I think that happens to a certain extent, but I still think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of legwork required after you get that first hit. You know, you can't just get a big mix once and people still have to know who you are. Yeah. So, and especially in like the social media world, like you just have to kind of be present. And I kind of fought social media for a long time until I kind of got comfortable with it from the podcast, really. And then I was like, shit, I should do, I should do stuff as an engineer. Like I should have Travis as an engineer and share I don't know, whatever I share on my Instagram. But if nobody knows who you are, regardless of how talented you are or what records you've worked on, you're still not going to get hired. So that's like yeah. the that's the biggest hurdle, I think, for a lot of people in this industry. I know me in particular is that I kind of expected that if I was great, that I would just get studio promotions and like get big records. And that's unfortunately not the case you know you, you have to be good at your job but you you're not guaranteed anything by being good 
Yeah, or by, you know, working at a huge studio, like, as you have, right? Like, yeah. you know, you worked at Capitol for a while. Um, so I'm sure, like, I'm sure that did open a lot of doors for you and obviously gave you outstanding experience in a pro studio like that. But, I mean, you know, even I've worked at, I've done, like, assistants and uh, assistant engineer and, like, intern and runner at big studios. But until you get to, like, that top engineer point, it's not really like going to open. It's not going to get you huge credits unless you get lucky and you insist on a big name or something. But how did, how was capital for you? Like in a nutshell, like was that uh, obviously it was a major learning experience, but did it really, did it open all the doors that you thought it would, or what was your like overall um, takeaway from it? Um, It was amazing. I wouldn't trade the world for it. Uh, so my, my, my short story there is that I started there as a runner. They call them setup guys, setup people. And, uh, that's, you know, setting up microphones at night, getting food during the day, coffee, cleaning, but there's a lot more setup because of the way that studio works. They do a lot of like jazz bands and orchestras, a lot of union sessions that like start at 9am and they end at noon. So like everything better be plugged in. So the night shift was always like setting up the orchestra or like setting up the big band and. So it was an amazing job. And I did that for about as long as I could and realized that I would probably get the next promotion when that promotion came, but it's a, it, it, it was a good job and people didn't leave. So, um, somebody came through who was doing uh, Disney stuff. He was doing a choir for like high school musical. And he asked the assistant, Hey, will you come record guitars for me? And he was like, I can't, I'm busy, but Travis doesn't work, you know, he's not here seven days a week. He might have some time, hit him up. And so I ended up quitting before I actually became an assistant because I was going to need somebody to quit or die before <laughs> I got a promotion. So, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, and I wouldn't wish, you know, anything bad on any of those guys. I love everybody over there. So I went to go work for this other guy, worked there for a couple of years, and then came back to Capitol because they were building these songwriting rooms for basically pop writing sessions. And that's what I'd been doing was all this pop stuff. And so I was like, oh, I mean, I'll skip assistant to a certain extent. I still did some assistant work and just go back and basically, was basically a vocal engineer for like five years and did some other random sessions and some assisting, but amazing studio, like so many lessons learned. And, you know, you talk about connections and doors. A lot of those, you know, those clients that i mentioned earlier, the revolving door of regular clients. A lot of them are, are from those capital days. And, you know, eventually when you work in one of those studios, you realize, um, kind of in parallel with your manager, realizing that people are calling and they're like, Hey, I want to get, I want to work with Travis again, or I want to work with Joe again, or Steve or whoever it was that they had a great experience with. And then you start to realize that, yeah, people are coming to this world-class studio, but part of the requirement is if I'm out of town on like this week, then they book the next week. Does that mean that they would work with me somewhere else? And you start Mm -hmm. to get that in your head. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so then you kind of realize that you've brought something to the table that other people are willing to, you know, be involved with. But um, I kind of ran off topic of your question, but yeah, that's kind of like my capital experience, man. It was, it was awesome. It was awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think there's something so, like, just exhilarating about if you do have, if you're an engineer, you're up and coming and you have the privilege and opportunity to work at one of these big studios and maybe star as an intern, maybe you get, you can get promoted to a runner, maybe assistant engineer. I think it's, it really like kicks your ass. It really like shows you how it's done. It really helps you learn fast. And um, if you can, if you can survive and, you know, adapt to the proper etiquette, um, yeah. it really help you um, just like kickstart your career. And I think even though it seems like that kind like the traditional way of coming up in a studio is, is happening less and less with new engineers. Like it seems like most new people that are getting into engineering production mixing, they're just like, they just start on their own and they, they get their gear and then they just start doing it on their own. I just, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think there's something really awesome about if you can have that experience of, you know, working at one of these 
pro like classic studios, um, iconic studios in, in Los Angeles, Nashville, um, New York, you know, London, wherever, like it, it really, really helps you like give a, have a more broad perspective of the industry. Yeah. And then I think it also, it really helps you prepare to work with, um, like A-list clients. Yeah. Which is a whole different, I feel like I treat everyone the same, whether if it's someone that just started a band in their garage that I'm working with or like a top level person, yeah, that's just how I am. But there are different dynamics to learn. There is different etiquette, like working with, um, different personalities, different, um, expectations so if you can get into a studio and have those experiences i think it's so valuable even to this day when a lot of bigger studios are closing their doors but fortunately you know there's still capital still sunset sound still like sound city so there's not still capital no no they uh that building that building is closed currently for earthquake retrofit oh shit so the studio uh, is closed for potentially two years Oh. Along with the building, but they're gonna they're gonna resurrect, right? I mean, hopefully. I mean, it's know, capital. That, they have what, to. That's what they say. <laughs> I mean, there's classic recording studios in that building that did Frank Sinatra records. But um, I wanted to add on to what you were saying. Uh, I, I really think the thing that you learn when you work in these big studios is you learn about the people and the expectations, which you mentioned. And yes, you can like buy a a Scarlet and an SM57 and an MXL mic, and you can start to learn to record things the way like, you know, we probably do with like four tracks, like a little digital DAW and just ruined a bunch of shit. <laughs> like you can totally Same. learn how to be an amazing producer or engineer on your own, but you cannot walk into a room and engineer a session for an orchestra. Right. No offense to somebody that's training themselves, you will crash and burn because you don't understand the etiquette. Yeah. If you're at a great studio, They'll put the mics where they need to be. They'll give you suggestions. The assistant can make sure the headphones are good. Like your your ass will get saved, but that's what you, you know, that's what you're not gonna learn on your own is mm. how those sessions work. Totally. And whether that's necessary, I mean, you know, there's enough engineers that can do that. So if you don't want to work in a big studio, you know, that's fine. I I, I think it's I think it's fine. I, I don't know my kid was 18 and they were in a, like wanted to work in a recording studio. I don't know whether I would tell him to get a job in a big studio or tell him to work for a person. I don't know what's better now. I think it's very, it's a, it's an interesting time. Totally. I think it just depends on the situation and what, you know, your goals are. If you want to have that traditional experience, then yeah, if you can get in at a sunset or a Paramount or wherever, um, yeah. then awesome you'll, you know, they'll kick your ass into shape and you'll see if it's really what you want to do. Like, you'll know very soon if it's, if it's what you want to do. Um, but you can also, you know, if you can make connections and then get in with maybe a producer or like work for just one person mm -hmm. exclusively and, yeah. uh, learn how they like things to be done. And that's a kind of a different experience. Um, that's where yeah. a lot of my, my additional experience came from is I worked for that one songwriter producer named Matthew Gerard for a couple years and we were doing a lot of Disney stuff like Hannah Montana and Jonas Brothers and TV shows and um, a couple TV TV shows like from the scoring side and it was like a whole different skill set it was like I had that traditional studio thing and then I was in a situation where somebody basically was they kept giving me more tasks and if I did the task good enough then I continued to do that task and uh, that was a cool way to learn as well. So there's really, there's a lot of benefits to both. Yeah. And I still feel like engineering and mixing, it's all, it's all very subjective. Like, because like if you go and you work at um, Capital or Sunset Sound or Record Plant, whatever, and maybe you're learning, you're, you're about to become an assistant engineer and the, just depending on which engineer you're working with, like, you know, never put an EQ after a compressor and then you go work with someone else is like, I want it before the compressor. It's like, well, which way is right? It doesn't matter. It's just like you learn depending on the situation you're in. And it's like, for me, it's like, you know, I have a certain way I like to do things, but it doesn't really mean it's right. It's just how I like to do things the same True. with you. So yeah, it's, uh, it can be kind of, it can be a little bit confusing if you're like being bounced around, uh, working with, 
different producers or engineers and like one guy does something far this way and the other guy does the exact opposite and you're like but i learned it's like which way is right it's like mm, it doesn't not really about being right it's about just catering to the artist catering to the producer you're working for so well, i think that might be one of the the perks of working in a studio because you see all the different methods of making a record and you realize that there are no rules and maybe a downside to working for one person is that everything feels like a template depending on who you're working for you might be like oh i didn't know i could do that but if you work at you know capital then the rules are going to be different every day yeah so yeah yeah i was uh like we, we were talking before we started recording um because like i i've worked at quite a few different studios and the past for the past maybe like seven or eight years i've been going to this one spot uh es audio in glendale for mm -hmm. most of my drums and when one of my one of my clients they're like let's go record vocals at sunset sound i was like awesome and then, but i was like i got a little bit nervous because it's a new room i don't know the, how the assistant's gonna be yeah and i want it to go smooth and it's like no matter how like how long you've been an engineer or producer like when you're thrown into a, an uh, like a new room and you don't know like how uh how organized it is if the patch bay is working if everything is working and it's like it can kind of slow you down no matter how long you've been doing it uh because you don't know the setup but when we when i got in there um the assistant was so good and everything was working great and it was just it just it was so fucking it's such a good feeling because it's like okay i can still i can still like ha have the confidence to go into almost any room and as long as like i have a good assistant like I can still, like, I still got it. Even though I've right. been at this one studio for so long and I've gotten used to the way it's set up and the signal flow and blah, 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 and I've been at my spot, like, because, you know, it's like when when you're working in your little bubble for so many years and then you're thrown into someone else's, it's like, oh, shit, I don't know if I, can I still do the, my best job? But then when you, like, it was it was a good feeling because, like, I've always wanted to work at Sunset Sound and it, cool, it was, it was cool killer. Spot. So, like, and you said you just, you were just over there doing a, a pretty sick session. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just did. Yeah. I did vocals right after you did vocals, like two days later. Yeah, uh, we were in Studio One, and that was actually my first time working over there. But the, when you you learn how things work, you kind of adapt. You know, it's it's like I understand how consoles work. So if you put me in front of an API I haven't seen or whatever, like, I'm gonna figure it out. But having a having a good assistant is always always key. Especially, uh, I, I actually, I was thinking about it while you were talking, I think being a great assistant is potentially more difficult than being a great engineer. Oh yeah. Because, oh, yeah. you know, the, a great assistant will make a, a great engineer even better. You know, they're always like one step ahead and it allows the engineer to think about not patching something or not asking for something because, uh, you know, the assistant did it right, but it's hard to be a good assistant. I've had a lot of bad assistants in this town, unfortunately, never at any of the major studios, but like every time I go to a studio, that's not one of the like big five or six, I'm always like, please. Just like, I don't go. want an assistant. <laughs> right. I don't want one. If it's, you know, unless it's like, at, yeah, like these, these spots where, you know, they're going to be phenomenal and like, you know, more competent than you most of the time at, with the gear or yeah. with the setup. So it's like, yeah. I get, totally get that. And yes. I mean, and if I have to go over there and figure out how the patch bay works, then we're in, we're in trouble because, yeah. um, that is, should be the, the, that bare minimum, you should be able to work the patch bay. Well, yeah, it's like, there's this, I mean, that's another thing too, is like, depending what studio you're at, like patch bays can be set up differently. So you got to learn how it's set up and then hopefully all the connections are solid. Cause sometimes there's bad connections and you're like pulling your hair out going like why isn't the signal going to 1176 everything looks patched and you so you never know so that's why it's like having a great assistant that has been in the room for years or and just knows what's going on so you don't have to think about the technicalities like of setting up is is killer so yeah and you said we had the same, had assistant, the same assistant at sunset um, and yeah it was alex it was such what a was treat. his last name alex miller miller yeah. crushed it alex thank you great job <laughs> um yeah, it was it was awesome. I'm gonna I'll be back um, in May for another session, but yeah, it was just it, it was just like such a treat, man. And, That's uh, awesome. It's a good so, spot. It's a good spot. Yeah, it's a lot of good studios in this town. So let's talk a little bit about your um, some a lot. I you know a lot of people know you for like some of these 
bigger mixes you've done, like, you know, the Taylor Swift and uh, Imagine Dragons and all this stuff. So, like, can you tell me a little bit about uh, your experience uh, working on, on those records and how it, like, helped your career, how it boosts your confidence, maybe, or how it maybe, like, shaped, um, you know, the further uh, projection of, of your career? Yeah, I mean, well, first I should I should say that the the ones you just mentioned there are engineering credits, not mixing credits, as much oh, as bad. I would love to uh, have taken Serban's credit or credit for Serban's work on on that Taylor Swift. Um, yeah, I mean those those records were very different, very different stories, um, very different experiences. I mean, the Imagine Dragons thing, I was working for the producer for um, maybe like a year and a half. And, you know, we just did like, we did like two weeks of tracking and I don't, I don't really know what they used. I know I recorded a few background vocals and it's one of those credits that like you, you get cause you recorded a bunch of stuff, but I can't really tell you what I did. Yeah. There's so many things get replaced in those pop records. Yeah. Um, so that one is like, it's a nice name to have on there, but you know, I can't take credit. I can't say that. I put a sonic stamp on that record uh, because those guys are, they're good dudes. We had a good time. They're capable of, you know, making a great record on their own. You know, they're all, they understand what's going on. Alex is a great producer. They all, everybody, you know, works together on those. But, uh, and the, the Taylor Swift thing was the, um, that was an interesting one. And you talk about like where work comes from and that, that totally came from like, my network. I'd been doing a lot of projects with um, the uh, the voice band because I was involved in that a little bit, and um, this was the Red re-record uh, that came out in twenty. Some somebody will know when it came out, um, but you know we were just kind of tasked with doing. And you know, a new master. Everybody kind of knows the story on what she wanted to do, mm -hmm. and uh, that was fun because it was it was really challenging because there was the level of it needs to a sound great because it's a huge record. Um, B it needs to sound like the other record, more or less, right? Like it can't it can't not be close. Um, I had to give it to the players on that one though because they had to learn the parts. You're just like, everybody's has to learn like note for note. And then, you know, then I have to try to match it sonically, get it as close as we could and then send it off to, uh, to her team. I know that they tweaked further. And so it was a fun, it was a really fun project because it was super challenging because it was different. It wasn't, Hey, come and record this band. It was basically, you know, redo this thing that is, you know, very successful and iconic. And uh, so there's three tracks on that album that that I engineered. Um, I can't remember the names of them, but yeah, can't remember. But awesome, yeah. Just to switch it up a little bit, I'm curious about. I don't think I've ever asked you this, but what what was the point where you decided I want to start a podcast about success in the music industry? Like, what what was your your moment when you're like, I want to, I want to do this. Like what, what made you decide to go down that road? That was, that was like kind of came from a few things. So it was 2020, everybody's in their house. Um, and I kind of wanted to do, I was really into productivity and like time management and stuff like that. And I wanted to do like a YouTube channel that was about that but for like musicians and I, you know, I started filming some videos and then like you look back at yourself and you're like, Jesus Christ, I can't, I can't look at this. I can't, <laughs> I can't be on film. And that happens to everyone though. Right. Yeah. And, uh, it's part of the, part yeah, of the, it, it's, part of the growing. Yeah. It's yeah. tough. It's tough. So it kind of, it kind of died for a moment, but like I still wanted to do something because at this point, you know, I was fully freelance uh, I'd met my wife. We were married. We were married at this point. Balancing my time between work and life was like super important to me. So my head was just in this world. And there was, you know, this, we'll, we'll probably talk about this more later. 
you know, I kind of reached this point where I began to accept like the career that I had and realize that my career is not going to match some other person's career. Like, you know, I've always wanted to be a mixer, but I'm never going to be Manny Mariquin and I'm never going to have his story. And I think when you come up through that like studio hierarchy, you believe that you're going to like walk in somebody's footsteps and you're going to like, I'm going to get a promotion and then I'm going to work for a producer and it's going to be one of these 10 guys because they come through the studio. And, and then when that doesn't happen in this business, I think a lot of people get really defeated and I was probably in that place. And I just kind of was just flipping the script on how I looked at everything. And so that's where the inspiration for the podcast came from is kind of just to like share some of these ideas that were helping me be happier with other people while at the same time getting to hang out and learn from people. And, um, it, it's kind of like networking. I mean, I've met a lot of friends, like that's how we met. Um, I'm not, I don't get work from my podcast really, but I have a lot of people that I now call friends that I probably would have never met before, which is dope. Uh, but yeah, the inspiration was kind of in this like changing mindset that I was having that I wanted to share, you know? So you had a, like a major realization and transformation, which, uh, it helped you focus on, uh, a different way of connecting with your audience and people that can resonate with you and your career and what you want to bring to the table. And I think, yeah, that's a great way. I think just podcasting in general, um, you know, whether you're doing it just for the love of it because you love podcasts and just the flow of it, or you have a specific message you want to get across, I think your your brand and what you're doing with progressions is is great, man. It totally it totally fits who you are like, as a person, and it. Nice. Um, I think I mean it's it's been great listening to. It's like it's helped me. Like there's been a lot of. Uh, insight from from you and your guests so I, I know it's helping a lot of people so maybe maybe you say it's not maybe it hasn't brought you a lot of work yet but you know it's gonna compound over time you know since it seems like you're gonna keep doing it for a while so you never really know what doors it can open for you so I, I mean since yeah it's what it's been three years so yeah yeah, yeah it's uh I just put out episode 88 and uh yeah no it's been a lot it's been a lot of fun I I think it's funny that you say that it's like very, it feels like me or it's very on brand because there's, you know, to a certain extent, uh, what's the best way to describe this? You know, like as an engineer, you kind of, at least me, and I, I think there's a lot of people like this, you kind of need like peer approval and you kind of like don't like to go outside the box. Like, you know, you'll like have some beers with your friends and make fun of so-and-so random person that's like doing mix tips and, and you're like, I would never do that. <laughs> yeah. And so like I had this a- engineer persona of myself and having the podcast be this separate entity allowed me to experiment with like putting how I actually felt out in the world without feeling like I was doing something that, you know, my engineering core base of, you know, 10 years, 15 years in LA would think is lame because <laughs> yeah. it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And funny enough, like, I feel like just in the last year, I've really found a way to crossfade to, to, to keep things nerdy crossfade <laughs> into, you know, bo- everything being the same, you know? And I, I feel like I had to go and stretch the muscle in the podcast and kind of have like a disguise for how I wanted to be. And now I'm comfortable with that being, you know, my personal brand some i'm glad that uh, you said that because i'm like all right it's working well i I've, i mean i listened to quite a few of your episodes and i've seen like your growth and how you've you fought you become more comfortable with the format and like mm-hmm. with you know your your episodes like you're you're very uh eloquent and it seems like everything is very thought out and it's all it's all very very good so i mean I noticed that I know a lot of other people like pick up on that. So I appreciate that. I've been, yeah, I've noticed like, you know, you're continuing success with it and how it's been improving over time and you're feeling more comfortable with it. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's great, dude. And I know it's, it's, uh, I understand because, you know, I haven't, I haven't been doing mine as long as yours, but 
it feels just, it's a bit, um, it feels liberating. It feels like, well, I'm just having conversations with like-minded people and I'm, I'm learning from them. Maybe they're learning from me a little bit and then everyone can take what they want from it. And, uh, maybe you can, maybe inspire someone to start music. Maybe inspire someone to, to want to become a producer or whatever. It's just, yeah. it feels really good. It yeah. feels really good to do it. Like, and it's, I feel like for me, it's like, it's about just doing it for myself to start. It's not about making money. It's not about, you know, getting a lot of likes or views. It's just about, it feels like, it feels like what some right to do. It feels like what I'm supposed to do. Just like this conversation with you. Like, yeah, it's supposed to happen. It feels like these conversations need to be heard. And a lot of them, uh, the topics are, are very real and they're very like behind the scenes. And it's cool to expose some, you know, more, um, not secretive information, but just knowing how things work behind the scenes. I think people really have, uh, take value in that and yeah. to, to learn about that. So yeah, yeah I, I think you're, you're doing a great job, man. Oh, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I think it's funny to go back and like, listen to, you know, an earlier episode and hear the intros and it's like, hi, welcome to <laughs> progressions. It's yeah. just, so it's, it's, it's funny, but, um, let's see, I have two things I wanted to say about that. Okay. So one being, I think it's great the just the format of podcasting because it's pretty honest, you know, and it's just back and forth. And yeah, you can edit it, but um, you can't you can't change the conversation yet. Yeah. You know, we'll get this AI thing coming <laughs> at us, but um, it, it's it gives a different presentation of people than they can put on social media. You yes. know, like the conversation that we're having, maybe like there would be parts of this that we would clip and put on our social media because it fits. You know or maybe not, but we had a conversation it exists and people can hear what the real thing is. And I think that's important because there's so much comparison in this business and it's so poisonous and makes people so frustrated that I think it's good to be able to listen to a real conversation. Yeah. I think that's huge. And then the other thing I was gonna say is this funny thing that happened when I kind of, I got used to doing the podcast. So when I started, I was, I would, you know, record for anybody that most people haven't heard my show, probably, um, I have like a, a short intro rant, right? I used to record it in playlists on, in Pro Tools. Like I do mm -hmm. like four or five passes of this thing and comp it like a psychopath. <laughs> and it would take so long. And now, you know, now I just feel comfortable reading it down if I need to like restart a paragraph. But anyway, the point being, the more things you put out in the world, the more comfortable you become with everything. I feel like I do mixes faster and I'm more confident because I'm used to doing pod. I'm used to putting a podcast out every week or every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And eventually you, you just learn, you learn that something is all of a sudden great. And then you can stop there. You don't have to spend 14 more hours on it. Totally. You know, like the song feels good. The mix feels good. The guitar solo felt great. Cool we're done. Like we don't need to do that for three more hours. We don't have to do four more guitar solos. If everybody in the room high five each other and they're like, fuck, this is amazing. So that was like an unexpected side effect to like putting content out in the world. Like I just became comfortable with it. Yeah. It's a huge benefit. I've, I've realized that myself, like you just become more accepting and comfortable with yourself. Cause like in the beginning, you're like, I don't like the way I look on camera. I don't like the way my voice sounds. I need to comp together the intro or I right. need to edit all the, I need to get the perfect lighting. I need to get the blah, blah, blah. And then the more you do it, the more you realize like, whatever, like I am how I am. I sound like how I sound like I look how I look like. And you know, I mix how I mix. And yeah. this is the, this is the best I can do right now. And just let it go. Yeah. You know, if this resonates with you, then let's hang out. If it doesn't, that's cool. Which is another thing I've found is like when you're when you're more open to like putting out like, you know, and I think this really applies to like artists and more so than probably us behind the scenes people. When you're really open to putting out like how you actually feel in the world, then you're going to like you're going to find a circle of people that feel that way as well. And, you know, coming from the artist side, you think about that, like you want to find your thousand true fans, like put out your most authentic music don't put out the thing you think is going to work because people are going to sniff through that bullshit yep so that's that's my rant on that
Love it, man. So I want to ask you, this is the, the theme question of the podcast. What was one of the darkest times in your life and what did you do to overcome it? And how did it create the better version of who you are today? This is, uh, I'm glad I texted you and asked you to prepare <laughs> anything because this one would like maybe push me over the edge if I didn't know. Uh, so I jotted some notes down on my phone that I left over there, but um, it kind of goes back to what I touched on, you know, prior to starting the podcast. You know, I'd been out here like working in studios, um, you know, whether this would be the darkest time in my life, I don't, I don't know, but it was a dark time that I think is applicable to the conversation, but um, you know, I've been working in studios for probably at this point, I don't know, 12, 15 years, you know, I'd had a lot of credits in varying degrees, you know, big records, little records, but I just, I was never satisfied with where I was. I felt like I was putting so much work in and like sacrificing so much. A lot of my friends at this point, all my close friends at this point were married I was single, working, never dating, not like only like happy if I was doing like a good gig or happen to get a birdie on the golf course, which was super <laughs> rare. And yeah, I, it was just a period where I was probably the pessimistic prick that like nobody wanted. Like if we went out for beers, like I was the first one to start bitching. Mm. And then everybody else will like pile on and they're like, yeah, man, I, I didn't like doing this record either. But like, why is it gotta be like that? You know, it's like, it, there's obviously some kind of like frustration if like every time you get together with your like industry buddies, like it's, you know, just, talking shit. just a negative, <laughs> even yeah. though like we're all getting paid to make music. Meanwhile, there's thousands of people that would love to get paid to do what we're doing, you know, and, and we're sitting here bitching about it. Um, so anyway, so that was probably like, it was probably a span of a couple years where I was really just truly frustrated with where I was and I felt like I was not being given the opportunities that I deserve. And that right, that's the sentence right there, given the opportunities that I deserve. Like if you have ever felt that way, then just, you need to get rid of that shit immediately and your life will change. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the change happened. I met my wife. Um, maybe she recognized some of these things in me. Maybe she didn't. Uh, and she convinced me to work with uh, a coach, you know, some people would say life coach. I hate to say that still, even though I found it helpful. So I say performance coach. That sounds, more, <laughs> that sounds better to me. I can stomach that more. Uh, but you just like, I started really kind of just wrapping my head around like how things occur to me. Like if somebody says something about a record I did, like, you know, how does that make me feel? And then you start to realize that like, a lot of the poisonous shit that you might have in the back of your head is like coming from yourself and that you're probably the one that's kind of so true you know what i yeah. mean um and so yeah it was a couple years of really just changing my attitude and you know i am i think that i'm way i know that i'm way happier than i was like six or seven years ago i also believe that i am significantly more successful and i feel that i am you know i'm more comfortable with the work that i do the decisions that I make. And I just didn't feel that way like seven years ago. And, you know, maybe it's like you turn 30 and you start to like wonder like, what the fuck am I doing? Am I going to make it? Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah. that's, uh, yeah, it was, I was the pessimistic, dark, angry guy for a long time. I think there's a lot of people that work in studios that end up like that. And so the podcast is kind of to help those people escape, you know? Yeah, man. I totally resonate with you there. It's, it's so easy to fall into that hole of like, you know, you work so hard for years and years and years and they, maybe some good things happen here and there. You, you, you're slowly building up your, your career, but it's like, you know, I just had this convers similar conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago, but it's like the farther, it seems like the farther you get, like just the more you want to accomplish, it's like mm -hmm. it never ends. So if yeah. you could just be happy with what you're doing right now and not worry about all the other things that, I mean, yeah, it's good to have goals and to have a plan, but it's really, it's really easy to just beat yourself up. If you're not like at a certain point, at a certain age, like that's, you know, that's torturous. You yeah. Know? Well, so. and that goes to the whole, like, y you know, the, the core of the podcast is, you know, 
defining success for yourself. And, and a lot of the guests that come on the podcast, when I ask them, like, have you ever redefined success for yourself? You know, some of them are like, no, you know, like I, I haven't, but I, I don't, I don't think that not everybody understands the root of that question because the, the root of that question is that, uh, you know, you wanted to like, you, you thought you would have this career and you don't. So at what point in your life did you realize that you weren't going to have this, but you can still have this if you choose to have this. And, and this might be better because this is actually what you're going to do. Or and this is what somebody else did that you're not going to do. Like, I'm never going to have your career. You're never going to have my career. So why do you, why do I want yours or you want mine? You know what I totally, mean? Totally. Totally. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I think something, um, this is a little out of context cause I, I should have said it earlier. I think the idea that you, like if you, if something happens to you and your view of it is that life is happening to you, then that's probably going to be one of the, the first things you want to realize that like you need to happen to your life. You know what I mean? Bad shit happens, but your reaction to every positive and negative thing that comes at you should not be the world did this to me or the world gave me this or the world stopped me from this. You yeah, I mean? totally. And it's like you, it's, it's really, really hard to, and exhausting to worry about all these external things that happen that you can't control. All you can do is focus on what you can control. Exactly. And, and how you act and how you treat others. So yeah, there's so many external things that happen in our lives that are unexpected, that suck, that are traumatizing, that mm -hmm. we have no control over. And it's just about how you come to the table with that and how you, um, how you can adapt and how you can, you know, continue to move forward with, um, the best mindset possible. So, but thank you for sharing that. Oh way. yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate you sh sharing that moment. Um, that's probably a yeah. tough question. You have some people like, uh, does it, does it get dark on that question? <laughs> it can, it, that's the thing. That's the question. It's open. It's like, you can go as dark as you want. You could, you could, you know, like it's just one of the darkest moments of your life. It doesn't have to be the darkest, but it's like a dark moment. So yeah, yeah, man, I, I can totally uh, relate to what you said and I think a lot of other people will enjoy you sharing that. So I appreciate it, man. Thanks. Um, Thanks. Before we wrap it up, is there anything else you want to, you want to plug, maybe plug your pod podcast or plug any projects you're working on this year? Um, well, I kind of plug that best friend thing. I mean, the podcast called progression success in the music industry. Um, it's on YouTube now started in 2023. It's, uh, so there's a video version as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I would just say, you know, if you have a question or you want to know something about me, just hit me up on social media or, or my website or whatever. Cause that's the thing I've really learned about podcasting is like, it's just fun to meet new people and like have conversations and expand your mind. And, um, yeah, so, uh, Instagram and TikTok, assuming it's not banned when this comes out, <laughs> is uh, T. Ference, T. F. E. R. E. N. C. E. Uh, podcast is Progression Success in the Music Industry, and that's at Progressions Pod. So, but uh, yeah, great. We'll put all the links in the description so everyone can go check out your website and um, your podcast and check out all the great guests you've had on and all the great takeaways. So thank you so much, Travis. I thank appreciate you. you coming by. It's been great to getting to know you, you know, it's over the last year or so. So I appreciate you, man. This is, this is fun, man. Thanks for having me. I got to steal some of these setup tricks from my, <laughs> my video show, but this has been a lot of fun. I enjoy it. Thanks.